Yeah, well, uh, good afternoon, and I want to thank the museum for hosting our talk today. Uh, so Nick and I are here. Uh, Mac uh, is running around somewhere. I think he's in D.C., but uh, we're all pretty available. When we started to conceive of this project three years ago, we really started off with a simple question. How and why did the United States become a superpower? And it's a little awkward in 2015 to answer that question, but I think as if you, if you look at the debates about the role the U.S. should play in the world, I think the question is still relevant. And in particular, if you have, uh, if you remember, small children used to play with light bright, uh, that idea, and so I really like the cover, though we had very little influence on, on what it came out, but we like this idea. At some point, though, after World War II, the United States really switched on. It switched on as an international actor. And we recognize that today uh, in the U.S. And there's very different explanations. You know, first, the United States, it's a large country. We're the third largest country in the world. Second, population. So third largest population in the world behind China and India. Uh, third, plentiful natural resources. So you see all the good news about how we're, we're becoming energy self-sufficient with all the new gas and, and uh, oil reserves discovered. So that also helps feed this idea, how did the U.S. become a superpower? Uh, others historically will point to, well, the U.S. was really the last country standing after World War II. Uh, and then you throw on the ro rise of the Soviet Union and the U.S. played in countering uh, communist expansionism also helps explain why we became global. But what I think we argue is, so if the U.S. rise was inevitable because of size, population, historical uh, chance of being left after World War II with a, a super strong economy and military, uh, we didn't have to be a liberal power. And by liberal power, what we mean is the U.S. promoted decolonization after World War II. So we didn't use U.S. power to claim territories. So you often hear the U.S. inherited the British order, kind of, uh, because the British were able to be liberal at home where Britons had liberal rights, free speech, press, assembly, uh, voting, uh, but the empire was not very liberal at all. Uh, and in fact, after World War II, the U.S. promoted decolonization for uh, U.K., France, and others to get rid of colonies and to promote national self-determination. And we think this is a really important point because it also breaks from the historical precedent of what great powers do. When you win a war, you're supposed to get the spoils to the war. But the U.S. doesn't do that. And so you can start going back from your World War II uh, period with the Marshall Plan. We didn't act like the Soviets where they went into their part of occupied Germany and took home factories uh, and equipment and people. Um, instead, the U.S., uh, we did have a generous visa program to bring German scientists to the U.S. and among other things. But the U.S. also spent billions of dollars of taxpayer money to rebuild Western Europe. We didn't attempt to kind of keep Germany down. Uh, we didn't attempt to kind of steal from their future by exacting uh, war retribution or anything. In fact, we supported a independent uh, and aided uh, with the development and, and reconstitution of Europe. And that's very different from how past powers behaved. Um, the U.S. also has very limited territorial ambitions. And so you, you do know the United States is a global power, and certainly being here at the Naval War College, I think we appreciate how the Navy enables that power by being able to operate anywhere in the world. And to me, being a superpower means that, uh, being able to deploy forces 8,000 miles away and sustain them indefinitely. And that's really what we've been doing in Afghanistan, you know, for example, in Iraq previously to that. Uh, and the idea that countries that are around the world, they don't fear uh, U.S. power or U.S. ships, uh, they often welcome them. And so you could look at Japan as probably the easiest example, where Japan provides billions of dollars a year uh, to host the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps in Japan. That's, again, unprecedented. We don't force ourselves on other countries. We, we seek to, to be able to treat other countries on an equal playing field with the idea by working together, we'll make things uh, better for everyone. Now, to be sure, the international system does speak with an American accent. So the international system is born in the USA. So the United Nations, for example, begins with the San Francisco, California Treaty. 
Now, Putin, I saw in his recent speech at the UN General Assembly, he says it all began in Potsdam, and therefore it, it speaks with a Russian accent. But I think that's a uh, we don't even need to debate that point. Uh, it's a San Francisco treaty. The UN is headquartered in New York City. It's not headquartered in Moscow, not London, not Paris, not Tokyo. Uh, and that gives us some distinct advantages. Likewise, the modern international economic system was born in New Hampshire, at Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. And so as we start thinking about, you know, for example, the International Monetary Fund to help stabilize currency and enable currency flows, uh, the idea of World Bank to promote infrastructure around the world, though that's an American uh, sort of at least conceived idea. Uh, and then what becomes the World Trade Organization as well, conceived in the United States, of course, <coughs> the importance of our allies. Uh, in a, in a I guess more mundane example, if we think about the Internet, for example, so we think of the Internet as essential today for social, commercial uh, interaction, um, born in the United States. And we get some special privileges of that. So the domain name system, for example, it, it still has been a subsidiary of the Department of Commerce. But a simple example is, so CNN, if you want to go to it, CNN.com. It's not um, CNN.co.us. But if you look at the BBC, for example, it's not BBC.com because it's British, it's bbc.co.uk. So if anything, we, we, being an American, we get to save a few keystrokes by not having to type .co for country and then the name of our country. And that's one of the benefits we get. Um, there's also more tangible benefits that we get. You know, first is we're a target for foreign direct investment, which means we garner more foreign investment than any other country, even China. We typically go back one and two. But when Toyota builds a factory in the United States, that's foreign direct investment. Uh, when Mercedes builds a factory, uh, the Hyundai Sonata, you know, for example, is built at uh, Montgomery, Alabama. That's foreign direct investment. Uh, people in other countries, other governments, want to put their money inside the United States. And we benefit tremendously from that. Um, the dollar is a global reserve currency. You know, dozens of countries uh, peg the, the, their currency to the U.S. dollar. So there's more stakeholders in the dollar because of that. And many countries use the dollar as its own national currency. My favorite example is Ecuador, for example, uh, which politically the relationship between the U.S. and Ecuador is not great, uh, but yet the Ecuadorian government uses the U.S. dollar as its currency. So everything occurs in U.S. dollars. Uh, it's not even a, it, it's very open, it's, it's official. Uh, and I'm sure politically that hurts uh, the Korea administration, but he understands that there's value in that. We get value in that because we're able to borrow more freely and we don't have to relive the debate about is debt good or bad? Are deficits good or bad? I'll say at least our government has the ability to borrow against its future. Not every government does. Um, not every government has the ability of foreign countries and banks and individuals to put money and investment in the United States. And, and so we benefit from that. Um, but we would say all of this didn't happen because there was a grand vision or a grand plan. We argue, and that's why the, we use the word incidental. And this is again one of, one of those inside publisher story where they kept arguing, the editor kept arguing, don't you guys mean accidental? And, and we had this conversation over several months, and we said, no, 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 we really mean incidentally. We didn't have to become a superpower. There was a series of small steps. And given our audience, the, the one I like uh, you know, on the military side is because our notion that we would fight wars abroad, we would reinforce Europe, or we would fight in Asia, we didn't build a territorial defense. We didn't build a military like that. We built a military that could deploy in a forward way and then sustain others. So then when the Cold War ends, all of a sudden now, the US government has this expeditionary capability where we could even conceive of the idea of putting 150,000 troops in Iraq. And we don't have to debate whether that was a good idea or not, um, but it is something that just kind of happened incidentally because we thought that's how we would fight uh, abroad. Uh, the other thing I just want to highlight before I turn it over to my colleague who's going to look at some continuities is, you know, from a defense perspective. So the, the example I like is Churchill's war bunkers disappeared after World War II. The Pentagon, which was built in a very hurried fashion, didn't disappear. Uh, and in fact, the Pentagon becomes what we know of today as a, as a permanent military uh, establishment. And that's a break from US history. Because prior to this period, there was a boom and bust cycle with defense. 
that we had a very s small standing military. And if you look back at the Constitution, you know, it says Congress shall, um, you know, provide and maintain a Navy and raise armies. So we should always have a permanent Navy. Uh, armies should come and go. And, and we lived that more way, you know, for about 150 years of our history. That started to change after World War II. So the Pentagon didn't disappear like Churchill's war bunkers. And instead, we put in place a series of policies that gave us where we are today. So the all-volunteer force, for example, which comes into effect in the 70s, uh, and really probably doesn't mature until the 90s. Um, and then I would say today the equivalent of, is how we treat the reserves. So the military reserves today are an operational reserve. Uh, they're no longer that strategic reserve that you see today. Uh, you know, I know in the Navy community, so 70% uh, of Navy intelligence deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan came from the reserves. Uh, and that's unheard of. And if you look on today, I think there's about 20,000 uh, reserve and guard on active duty. And, that, and that's a huge change. And as we start to look at kind of declining budgets uh, in DOD, the active component is going to continue to rely more on the reserves to, to augment any sort of uh, capability downslide. And that, again, I would add is, you know, becomes an incidental thing, how we transform the reserves from a strategic reserve to an operational reserve. Uh, but that's uh, kind of the defense strategy sort of overview. But I wanted to invite my colleague up, uh, uh, Nick Vozdev, to really talk about continuities in, in foreign policy. I wanted to go back to the point that Derek raised about our fight with the publisher about accidental versus incidental, because I think, as Derek noted, uh, it was very clear that the United States was going to become a major power because of our geography, because of our economic and military potential. But the way we became a superpower was not foreordained, and it was a result of choices that we made after World War II. If we had stuck to the Rooseveltian vision that he had envisioned in 1944 and 1945, the United States would have been the chairman of the board of great powers. We would have been the predominant power in the Western Hemisphere. <coughs> but much of the rest of the world would have been managed by the other great powers, China, Soviet Union, Britain, France. They were supposed to take that leading role. And we were just going to be the offshore uh, balancer that would provide necessary capabilities to back them up in keeping order in the rest of the world. When that vision does not play out because Britain and France and China are not able to play those roles and the Soviet Union makes it clear it is not interested in partnership, it would prefer to move for domination in Europe and in Northern Asia, uh, we have to adjust. So that's where the incidental nature uh, begins to emerge. And that begins to develop a series of interests which then become continuities in how the U.S. approaches the world. So in the late 40s, we begin to develop, for the first time, and against the advice of George Washington, entangling binding alliances with other countries, giving them security guarantees that if they are attacked, the United States will uh, respond to their defense. Starting with NATO, we attempt to do it in other parts of the world with some lesser degrees of success. We do it with countries like Japan and South Korea. Uh, we move to this expeditionary uh, approach. We don't just simply base our military at home. Uh, we develop the idea of combatant commands. So we retain some of our combatant command structure from World War II, and then eventually we expand it so that the entire globe, every square inch of the globe today is covered by a U.S. combatant command. Uh, no other country does this. And then, of course, we develop the capabilities to project and sustain power uh, around the world. And we make it clear that we identify our own domestic interests with the preservation of this global order. So we create international institutions. We say that free trade and keeping trade lines open is not just simply a benefit for the world, but it benefits the United States. And so this helps to develop a certain degree of continuity from the late 1940s to the present day. As administrations change, yes, administrations will change their priorities when presidents come in. They may have a different part of the world that they focus on. Some presidents prefer to emphasize the military dimension of power. Others may look at uh, the diplomatic side or the economic side. Uh, but we've had this continuity of interest that says that the United States must remain globally engaged, not simply because it's good for the world and we're doing it out of the goodness of our hearts, but because this is what benefits American peace and prosperity. So that starting with things like the Marshall Plan in the late 1940s, we were not just simply giving money to the Europeans because we felt sorry <coughs> for 
uh, Europeans who were living in the ruins of World War II. This was directly benefiting American businesses, uh, American companies, American farmers. Uh, we develop a whole network of providing food aid around the world. Again, not simply because uh, we see starvation in other parts of the world and want to help, but it becomes a boon to our own agricultural industry. Uh, at various points, we were one of the few countries in the world that we didn't completely avoid the trap, but we mitigated it, the guns versus butter trap, which the Soviet Union fell into, so that every ruble of Soviet defense spending was a ruble that was not spent on uh, the domestic economy, was not spent on domestic production, whereas in the United States, we have generally had uh, a spillover that every dollar that we spend on defense spending generally returns 60 cents in economic growth back to the U.S. economy. That ranges everything from putting a base in a particular area of the country and having the spillover effect of small businesses around that base benefiting from having a serviceman. Of course, you know, we all know the stories of issuing uh, servicemen with $2 bills so that uh, local merchants would know precisely how much their benefit uh, they benefited from the presence of that military facility, but also our ability to uh, allow for military technologies to be licensed for commercial use. Uh, the Soviet Union actually had more advances in computers and lasers at various points in its history. They never allowed that to spill over to the domestic economy. Whereas we look at defense spending and NASA spending in the 1960s and 70s, the allowing of that to spill over into the domestic economy, whether it's the internet, uh, whether it's microprocessors, we're seeing it now that things we've developed uh, to deal with, say, battlefield combat wounds, how can we bring that into the civilian health sector, nanotechnology is a promising field, uh, advances in uh, cybernetics, which started in the military sphere, and now we're looking for civilian applications. So what happened is, is that over the last 60 years, the projection of this international forward international uh, position of the United States was something that the U.S. political system would justify because we benefited from it. Our engagement in the world, we mitigated our isolationist tendencies over the last 60 years because more and more Americans said we, we drive concrete benefit from being involved in the world, whether it's because we're drawing on foreign sources of oil or trade uh, or natural resources uh, or things like that. Where we are today and where we end our book is we say, are we now at a new inflection point? That is, we've had, we've evolved as an incidental superpower over the last 60 years. We have developed a way of looking at the world, looking at foreign policy, looking at national security uh, through the Cold War and immediately into the post-Cold War period. But are we now at an inflection point where that incidental superpower uh, is no longer meeting, or the American public no longer believes that it meets their needs and interests? Uh, and this can be from a variety of things. And for example, if we do become truly energy self-sufficient, we can source all of our energy needs from certainly U.S. sources, but maybe just from within the hemisphere. So our Canadian oil sands, Brazilian ethanol, the new discoveries off the coasts of Brazil and Cuba, uh, rejuvenation of the Mexican oil industry. Does that change our commitment to keeping the Persian Gulf open? Do we suddenly say we no longer need to the, the Carter Doctrine and Reagan Corollary, which said keeping that part of the world secure and safe and stable was a core U.S. interest. If we're not pulling our energy from it anymore, do we say it's no longer our responsibility? Let China handle it. Let India handle it. Uh, if more manufacturing returns to the United States, and as we have this revolution of 3D printing, where you no longer buy 10,000 widgets being produced in a factory in China, uh, but you have a local facility that can give you a very specialized product that you need uh, that is produced locally. Uh, do we lose our emphasis on wanting to keep those sea lanes open? Is it as important to sell goods and services abroad? Uh, we also argue, have we reached a certain sclerosis in our national security system? We were very nimble in the 1940s and the 1950s in responding to uh, crises in the world. When you look at how quickly the Marshall Plan got through, how quickly the NATO alliance was ratified, uh, how quickly we were able to respond, and you look today at uh, a much slower pace. We have all of these institutions that have built up over time. Are they now a drag on us? In other words, we're still responding to the world of the 21st century with the institutions that 
evolved over the last 60 years and now they're slowing us down rather than being a way for us to move forward. Uh, that's a concern that we have and I think we will see this, these will be the issues that uh, we will continue, they'll be debated obviously in the presidential race uh, and we'll see this continue as we move forward uh, in the next decade which is what will be our role as a superpower, uh, what will be our role as other powers begin to acquire these capabilities that for so long and, and certainly for the last 20 years we've gotten used to uh, exercising in a sole capacity. So as Derek said, we were up to this point, we've been the only country that can sustain a large military force thousands of miles from our home base. Uh, we've gotten used to certain uh, freedom of action uh, in our ability to dominate airspace and particularly in places like Iraq and Afghanistan where uh, insurgents don't have uh, fifth generation aircraft and don't have uh, sophisticated capabilities. Now as we start to move into a world where uh, adversary, potential adversaries, rising powers can uh, inflict uh, can inflict the damage on us and raise the costs for us to act. Will we continue to do so as that gap narrows and as other countries can say, well, we can send forces. Uh, obviously, the Russian intervention in Syria is still very small, not that far from core Russian bases, but uh, uh, a reminder that other powers are now beginning to redevelop in, in the case of Russia and in the case <coughs> of China when Chinese ships show up in the Mediterranean to do an exercise uh, in a part of the world we kind of thought of going back to the old Romans as, as our, our sea, our area of operation and suddenly you have a Chinese ships in the Mediterranean or in the Caribbean where we often have thought of that as our backyard. That may change uh, our, our issues and so then I guess what I'll leave you with to conclude my section of the remarks is are we going to see another period now of incidental evolution of what it means for the United States to be a superpower in the 21st century and what changes might that bring uh, to the types of institutions and policies that for the last 70 years have defined how the U.S. has approached its national security and foreign policy. Yeah, we can just, yeah. No, I think uh, we wanted to reserve time for your questions so we do have about a half hour or so. Um, so yeah, please. Uh, to the last point you made, uh, in this evolution whether we're at the inflection point or not, which do you consider the most disruptive and dangerous? The fact that perhaps we may not be able to any longer sustain such a force overseas, or the fact that somebody else can? You want to, you want to? Uh, I think that the fact that others can sustain raises our raises our temperature because for the last 20 years we've gotten so used to being able to operate in most theaters with no opposition and where we could go in with not having to take many risks or the risks were very low uh, and so that now that other countries are showing their ability as, as we've seen now with Syria that our calculus suddenly changes once there's Russian airplanes flying out of Syria and we no longer have uncontested uh, ability to, to fly over Syrian airspace and we now have to think about doing it. So I think the second is the is the bigger issue because that raises our, it changes our calculus uh, to say well what are we willing to lose and this uh, a formula that Derek likes to use in foreign policy is what are we willing to die for, what are we willing to kill for, what are we willing to pay for and what are we willing not to do any and I think for the last 20 some years uh, we could inflict a great deal of killing and damage without having to do a lot of dying ourselves, comparatively speaking, yeah. uh, based on when you look at <coughs> World War II or Korea, and we've gotten used to that. It also means that our politicians have a much lower tolerance for risk, so I think we're now in that phase where having to say this matters to us, but we may need to lo think about losing more ships, more aircraft, more people, changes our calculus and, our, and, and how that plays out over the coming years I think will be interesting and it could then tie into this neo-isolationism that we're seeing emerge at least in some segments of the American electorate saying you know the rest of the world we did our we did our bit for keeping the world safe and secure now someone else can take on this burden. Yeah and, and I'm not quite sure it's uh, an either or either yeah. um, because if you look at kind of the nature of warfare I would say at least probably forever but at least the last 20 years, it's coalition warfare is the norm. Mm. So it's rare the U.S. does things unilaterally. I mean, I kid my class that the last great war the U.S. fought was Panama, you know, in the sense of it was, it was unilateral, it was overwhelming force, 
30 years later, it's stuck, right? Democratic, capitalist, friendly country to the United States. We can't claim that with any other country, uh, the last war. And, and so there is this sort of frustration. You know, on the one hand, I think we're, we're happy that great power tensions are relatively low. Of course, we have differences with Russia and China, uh, but they're also partners in many respects. And so, for example, if we take Russia, uh, the U.S. can't get to space without Russia today. Sustainment in Afghanistan is dependent on Russia. Uh, if we look at on the China side, uh, it's easy to point to the negative, but then we could also point out, you know, on the, on the positive side, uh, any sort of issue with North Korea, China is essential. We look at the Iran question, it was the P5 plus one. Uh, Russia and China included, that helped us, you know, got the Iran nuclear agreement, which we think is important. Uh, and so sometimes I think what we try to do is, is we confuse normal diplomatic friction that we see today and we try to put it back in this old Cold War sort of thing. And so jokingly, again, I'll tell my students, if you really want to hurt the Chinese, just close the port of Long Beach. Right? China's growth and rise is dependent on U.S. imports. The economies are intertwined whether we like it or not. And I would argue we like it. This is part of the U.S. plan um, and, uh, to, to raise China. I mean, this is why Nixon went to China and every U.S. president since has gone and enabled that. Uh, we benefit tremendously from that. I know that's not popular to say, but our standard of living as Americans is higher because of China. Um, and, and so we have to learn to kind of reconcile with that ambiguity and I think at least the last 15 years have taught us we've, we, we've struggled to translate tactical victory into strategic victory. And, and I think a lot of that has to do not necessarily with the U.S. military but with the nature of conflict which is primarily internal these days. I mean that's something we should be celebrating. I mean the, the, I don't think we're terribly worried about nuclear war today but if we go back to the 1980s, absolutely. Well, absolutely. Sir. I wonder if you can share some insight you might have for foreign policy and defense strategy on uh, what looks like the 21st century version of invasion, mm. which is immigration. Uninvited people coming into the country, not with tanks and infantry anymore, uh, and intending to stay, mm -hmm. uh, but with, the, with the, in large numbers. Um, is there so any insights from your analysis that you can help with us? What kind of a policy strategy we do, can we cope with that? Yeah, I mean, I would say you know the U.S. has largely benefited from legal and illegal immigration. I mean, really, when it comes down to it, and we we still haven't reconciled this notion of yeah, it's a violation of law. However, there right we it's U.S. companies, it's U.S. individuals offering illegal immigrant immigrants jobs, um, and I you know again and, and as I globally think about why the U.S. does so well in the world is because we have this unique ability to integrate populations from all around the world. And we don't suffer, certainly in New England, I don't think we suffer from nationalism. I think if we went, we're in southwestern border, there, you know, there would be a different sense. But um, we don't, I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't share the same. It seems to be a different thing. These yeah. are not folks who want to assimilate. Uh, yeah. But that's different, very different. And, and these are folks that could be controlled by an outside power. You, you made reference or alluded to the fact that security is an internal thing now, yeah. or an internal thing. And this will certainly uh, amplify that. It's well, it is an interesting question as well. I'm just thinking about the larger, you know, the, the, the global picture, which is that it, it raises questions about how permanent the current map of nation states is, which is that we kind of, we look at the world and we kind of look at the snapshot and think, well, that's permanent. Um, so we see, you know, migration changes in the European Union, and not, you know, and and we just finished. We had the the Ruger conference here, which was looking at Ukraine, uh, but then also be, that situation is tied to the migration crisis, but is also tied with a number of smaller European countries, particularly those that had just escaped from Soviet domination, now saying, well, wait a minute, are we going to have? You know, we fought hard to preserve our identity and culture, but we're you know, two million people, and if the European Union wants us to take, you know, 100,000 or 200,000 migrants, and then the question is, is are people, say, going to learn, like, Lithuanian or Hungarian? Probably not. They'll speak English. It kind of changes the dynamic there. And that, that produces tensions, because you have people saying, I want to hold on to uh, national identity 
uh, and not uh, not have it just be changed. Uh, and you know the question in the in you know the big migration questions in PACOM in the next 50 years, which is uh, you have Russia and Australia, two resource-rich countries, two land-rich countries, two wa well Russia water-rich countries, uh, and lots of populations. Uh, that look at that land and say, well, there's 5 million Russians here and 400 million Chinese across the border, so why not just just shift? So I think that that will become an issue. And then the question is, you know, do countries assimilate, which is mm -hmm. do they bring people in, and are those people wanting to be assimilated? Uh, do countries export their populations uh, and then hope that that creates uh, levers of influence so that yeah. you know you send your population and you make sure they still have passports and you still say that you're they're your citizens but now you have a reason to and you know the russians use this in parts of the former soviet union to say well those people are russian passport holders so they weren't migrants in the same way but the the principle is there uh, and then what it does for uh, the cohesiveness of current allies uh, and even within the u.s i mean as we see as our demographics change you know Will we focus less on Europe? We have more immigration from the South and East. You know, do we become more of an Asia Pacific and hemispheric power? And therefore, what happens in Europe doesn't matter because you have more people who then say, you know, what happens in Europe? I don't care. I don't. My family doesn't come from there. I don't think of them as being connected to us. Uh, and the same thing in Europe, which is, uh, we've seen the impact of changes in demographics in Europe of European countries willing to partner with the U.S. and the Middle East, saying, well, you know, the U.S. has a particular approach. So I think that, that that does become this question of, you know, and it, it actually, if I may, just it, it touches on a larger question about the changes in the nature of war and conflict because, you know, our old model, our Cold War model is, here's my border, you cross it with tanks, that's an invasion. We had 2007 the cyber attack on Estonia, right, which crippled their uh, crippled their banking system, crippled their government system, cost uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in economic damage, uh, probably occurred from Russia, of course couldn't be con conclusively proven, and the Estonians said, we were attacked, NATO, do something, and people said, well, but, you know, NATO is, you know, invasion means somebody has to come with a uniform and a tank and cross your exactly. border, but does a cyber attack count? Do little green men count? Migration, I mean, all of these then begin to change the nature of what is war, what is conflict, and then what is the nature of your obligation if you're in a treaty relationship with the country to protect them. And, and the Hungarians didn't quite make that appeal to NATO, but they were on the verge of saying, well, you know, we're being overrun by migrants coming in from Serbia. Uh, NATO, maybe you better send, you know, they didn't, they didn't, they decided that not to make that NATO appeal. Um, they went to, through the EU, but that would have been a very interesting discussion if the Hungarians had gone to <coughs> Brussels and said, you know, we need the deployment of, uh, of you know, NATO countries need to provide forces to stand on our border to, to keep people out. And whether or not NATO would have honored that as an Article 5, I don't know. So you've, you've opened up an interesting, yeah. because the whole nature of war in the 21st it's century is changing. changing. And in the North American context, uh, you know, I'll, I'll point to prominent Americans like Dave Petraeus and Bob Zellick, former World Bank president, deputy of Sec state. Uh, they've argued uh, we should think about NAFTA in a political context. I mean, NAFTA, our largest trading partners, Canada, Mexico, China's number two, but Canada and Mexico are one and three, respectively. Uh, think, start evolving NAFTA to think about it in a political context, where partly they're militarily because of NORAD with Canada. Um, and so these, you know, Petraeus and Zelik, they chaired a commission for the Council on Foreign Relations about a year or so ago. Yeah. And this is one of their conclusions is, look, if we want to compete globally, we need to start talking about the NAFTA, just like we talk about the European Union. Or ASEAN. Yeah. Sir. I just want to poke a little bit at your use of the word incidental again. Uh, I would think that uh, uh, President Truman, Eisenhower, Senator Vanden, uh, Vandenberg, and these, this collection of people that decided that it was better not to return Germany to pastoral, or even the same thing, and the same thing applied in, uh, in Japan, that that was not incidental. This was an absolute reversal of, of, of uh, Republican policy to now support an international order as defined by, by uh, uh, Truman and, and Eisenhower. And it just strikes me as being kind of counterfactual. That was a deliberate move 
to make us something other than incidental power, but a, a world power that had real control. Am I just misreading what they did? Well, I think what we meant by incidental was that in the absence of certain factors not being in place, say like the Soviet Union had collapsed in 1945, <coughs> that as a result of the war, you know, you had an uprising and, you know, the army says enough with communism, we're going to march on the Kremlin and take out Stalin and, and the Soviet Union falls apart. We may not have done those things then. We would not, maybe, we would have said, we would have gone with the Morgenthau plan and said, hey, you know, Germany can be pastoral, Japan can be... So for us, I think incidental was that there were these, we were reacting to things. We didn't, we didn't come in in 45 with a plan saying we're going to rebuild Germany, we're going to create NATO, we're going to sign a defense treaty with Japan. It was incidental reactions to things that were happening that otherwise we maybe would have gone back to. So in some ways it was being driven by these events rather yeah. than by an American no, plan. No, yeah, a small, I think too, I, we use it as a series of small decisions that led to this. And so I have to take both words at the same time. Back to why did the U.S. become a superpower? It was incidental. Certainly decisions were made, but if you look back at the plan and, and the easiest one to see without digging deep into to history is uh, why the Soviet Union ended up on the UN Security Council. The U.S. was in a position to dictate in 1945 the composition. And I think in retrospect, we would look at that as like, ah, what a, what a horrible decision. I mean, we ended up with 50 years of heartburn. Who, who in the right mind would put the Soviets on the Security Council? But the original idea, as Nick uh, mentioned, is the world would be governed, the U.S. would be kind of this chairman of the board and this sort of the, I always want to say the four horsemen, but it's yeah. the, uh, this four idea. Four policemen. Four policemen, thank you. Um, <laughs> but the idea, you know, the idea of China at the time, Taiwan, would kind of manage Asia and, and the Soviet Union would manage Europe, you know, Eastern and Central, and, and the Brits would manage uh, Western Europe, and we can kind of focus on our own hemisphere and not worry about it. Uh, and then, and, and we saw the impact. So the, the rapid demobilization after World War II, and then you can look <coughs> at the, the Korean War you know, as the consequence, you know, of that. Uh, and there was a bit of a, right, there was a bit of naive. I mean, people did make some naive assumptions, you know, about how the world was going to unfold after 1945. Uh, and then we kind of shifted along the way. But I think we ended the war, the, even before the war ended, we started off in a very different spot. We thought we were going to be able to share power with the Soviets and the Chinese to manage global affairs. Yep. Um, yeah. In 1950, when I first went to sea, uh, we would be, we were highly respected. We won World War II, and people wanted to do business with us, and we had good products to sell. And when we would enter, say, Africa with, uh, with a rusty old tanker, they would dip the ensign to us. And you'd go buy an old tug that was half dead. They would do the same thing. So now we've lost that ability. In fact, when we'd go into the Persian Gulf, we'd go into Rastanura, Saudi Arabia, and if there were 50 tankers there, they'd look at the flying red horse, and we went right in. And uh, one of our captains had a, a big limousine come down, and he was a friend of the king. And he had done that when they, 1930s, when they were building Saudi Arabia into an oil producing country. So trade, with our 42 percent of, of our commerce carried in merchant ships, yeah. had friends worldwide. Yeah, U and U.S. flagged yeah. merchant yeah. ships. So and, and we all know, I mean, there are very few U.S. flagged merchant ships that travel outside of territorial waters. Uh, and yet, right, the U.S. Navy still views it as important as keeping the oceans <coughs> open and freedom of navigation. And if you want to be negative uh, or cynical, uh, you know, the idea is we keep the, the Strait of Hormuz open so the Iranians can export oil to China. Um, is that a good use of taxpayer dollars? You know, the, people are, you know, uh, and that's where we start saying is, are we at an inflection point where you can think of that? Or does the U.S. continue to derive value by kind of enabling the international system? And, and it's not all, you know, the, all peace, love for the United States because, uh, you know, part of its own actions, and, and we devote a whole chapter in the book about the U.S. goes to war every three years. And I can, I can walk you back chronologically 
we're at war, a new war every three years. 2014, it was Syria, Iraq again. 2011, it was Libya. Uh, and then you have right, Afghanistan, Iraq, 2001 to present, you, you know, and so on. Keep, keep going back. So the U.S. doesn't, you, where there's an important peaceful dimension of what the U.S. does, it's very easy for other countries that have been on the re receiving end of that to, to kind of paint another picture. And that's part of U.S. history. And, and the challenge for our diplomats around the world is to be able to explain U.S. actions like these in a way that says we are attempting to make the situation better. And that can't always be easy. So if you see a Foreign Service officer out there, make sure you thank them for their service too. Yeah. Well, you see that with, you know, the, the, the shift and we talk about this uh, and, and certainly this was also a, a book that Charles Cupshin wrote about our predilection for wanting to turn former enemies into friends. Uh, where we believe, we, we did not, and again, going back to Derek's point about not that Americans are necessarily more moral uh, than others, but we identified, we made a change in our security. We're, most countries identify that when they go to war, they have to ground the enemy down so that the enemy can never challenge them after that war. The whole, you know, we're going to take Carthage and burn it to the ground and salt the earth. Whereas we feel that we're, our security is enhanced if we go in, rebuild, uh, develop those relationships, uh, and so that for, you know, 1999, Montenegro was being bombed by NATO air forces, and now it's on the verge of entering Becoming NATO. Becoming a NATO member. It's going to become a NATO member and part of the alliance, so. In 1950, I was invited to a Fourth of July celebration in Alexandria, uh, Egypt. And uh, when we got there, I never saw booze flowing in such quantities. Mm. And uh, they had a French general walked across the floor and collapsed. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> sounds, sounds like good times. Yes, sir. Uh, can we go back for a minute, maybe, to the uh, business of the cyber threat? Is the uh, subtle changed invasion, not people who are coming in as migrants, legal or illegal, but rather uh, computer viruses yeah. that can pose a threat, uh, an increasing threat. There's a book that's coming out now about the vulnerability and the danger of uh, the electrical grid. The, yeah. uh, yeah, Cyber Ted, Ted Koppel. Uh, Have we built our own Trojan horse hmm. and stocked it with the uh, real threat? Yeah. Well, you're the EMC uh, chair. This is your... Uh, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so the one, the one good... You know, so the book has been reviewed a few times already, and the one criticism uh, that we got was, uh, you guys didn't mention cyber. And I talked to the reviewer. I'm like, yeah, you're right. You know why? Because at the same time, I published a book on China and cybersecurity. <laughs> and so I think I had compartmentalized, and, and I didn't want to get wrapped up, and I think we both didn't want to get wrapped up in specific threats. We, we were looking more broadly. Um, you know, the challenge for these threats that don't resemble traditional things is we don't know how to deal with them. And it goes back to, you know, on the cyber, it's t I assume you're talking about Ted Koppel's new book. Uh, and there's a, there's a big debate, cyber war, no cyber war, you know, we're, we're, we're going to all wake up, uh, you know, one morning with no electricity or not. Um, uh, you know, all I could say, at least so far, is we think about cyber, it's really kind of in a, in a criminal perspective, people stealing identity, credit cards, some financial, uh, it's done in an espionage way, secrets. Now, the U.S. and China recently... I don't know if they signed anything, at least they agreed publicly that we will not target each other's intellectual property. Because the, the U.S. Yeah. is splitting hairs. Uh, the U.S. says, look, you know, espionage is kind of a historical way of doing things. Just don't go after economic data. And, and that's really where the, you know, we're pressuring the Chinese along those front. Maybe at some point, you know, partly I, I go back to the Willie Sutton idea, uh, or he robbed banks because that's where the money was. You know, that the U.S. is where the intellectual property is, and it's not only targeted by China, but, you know, many, many other countries. You know, does that trigger war? You know, I go back to, well, what, at what point can you no longer discuss? And, and the frustrations that some people have is you, is you look at, you know, Chinese behavior on cyber, and you say, wow, we need to do something. 
Okay, well, well do what? Do you want to jeopardize Chinese uh, buying U.S. Treasuries to finance U.S. government operations? Do you want to jeopardize uh, Chinese role in controlling North Korea and participating with Iran? Do you want to China, you know, compromise your second largest trading partner? Um, it, you know, from an administration perspective, I don't think it makes the big list. It's on the list, but it's not at the top of the list because the U.S.-China relationship is so complex. Um, you know, I will say I'm also on the Rhode Island State Cyber Commission, and so the governor has been, you know, working very strongly to understand the nature of the threat and how it fits uh, to individual citizens. Because, you know, the, the U.S. government only deals really security at the national external level, but most of our security is done at the state and local level through the police. And so the governor is really trying to get her, uh, her arms around this and seeing how it goes. Source of tension? Ab absolutely. We're still talking, yes, because there's a lot of the relationship is really complex. Uh, yes, in the back. I have a question about the book. You mentioned um, the subject about rediscovering the intensity of national interest and redefining national interest as a response to the whole change in geopolitical sphere and defense and everything. Like, what could it be? What could be different about our national interest? As, like, to me, for my research, I rediscovered that um, national interest is very connected with national identity. And national identity as of us, the United States, is like in leadership, in free trade, in democracy, and human rights and freedoms. So that's always going to be pinnacle of everything we do in assuring that this is met. Like, what is your perspective and what could be different? Like, how we readjust, rediscover our national interest yeah. in the current affairs? Well, let me give you two examples. Um, and I've already alluded to one, which is a redefinition of our national interests as they relate to the Middle East and the Persian Gulf, which is to say, Saudi Arabia, you're an autocratic monarchy. We don't like your monarchy. We don't like what it's doing. You're selling most of your oil to China. We don't need your oil. You and the Chinese figure out how to get your oil out of Saudi Arabia to Asian markets. We're not going to base anyone there. We're going to close our bases down. We're going to come home and we're going to kind of, on the lines of what Derek said, we're going to kind of create a super Western hemispheric community and we're going to say, you know, this is where our energy and, and trade is and you know, lots of luck to you. So that could be a redefinition because for ever since the 1970s, and even before, going back to when Roosevelt met with the King in 1944, we have said the security of this part of the world is a core national interest of the United States. That could be a redefinition if we have more of our, and we could say, no, not our concern anymore. Uh, on the, you know, we have this definition of ourselves as democracy and human rights, but the question is, is that are we missionaries or are we city on a hill? Which is, that is, we're here to spread it to the rest of the world, or we suddenly go back to saying, you know what, this is how we do it, and you want to follow what we do, great, but we're not going to spread it anymore. So the impact of kind of the Arab winter now, not the Arab spring anymore, and we say, you know, we're done with trying to transform societies. Uh, Afghanistan, we'll see what happens in the aftermath of Afghanistan, but, you know, we can't really look in 2015 and say that, uh, you know, liberalism has taken real root or hold there. Uh, and so we may, we may redefine our national interest back to the way, you know, back to a John Quincy Adams approach, which says, yeah, human rights and democracy matter, but they matter to us as an example, a light to the rest of the world, not for us to, as he said, you know, we don't seek monsters. Uh, out in the rest of the world. So that could feed back in. There's a new type of American exceptionalism, which is that, yeah, America is exceptional, and it's exceptional because it's America, and the rest of the world is not like America, so it's useless to make the rest of the world try to look like America. Come home, America. You know, secure our borders, secure our area, and, you know, let, so that could, be a re that could be a redefinition. And we sort of, you know, we're going to see what happens in the presidential race. We, ha we saw some of that being articulated seems to be diminishing now, but, you know, last year when people were looking at some of the candidates were saying, well, we can see this isolationist redefinition emerging, Could, but that, that strand is in our political DNA as well. I mean, the missionary DNA has been active for the last, well, since Wilson and definitely since World War II, but the isolationist DNA is there too, which says, you know. 
Yeah, I like the City home. on the Hill versus Missionary. I would add uh, Referee versus Spectator. Mm. I think the one thing we don't appreciate as Americans is we get to be a referee um, because we have the distance. We don't have, if you start thinking about, I mean, there's historic nationalist rivalries. Um, I can't think of one with the United States. I mean, the U.S. tends to, even the Brits, they burn down the Capitol, they burn down the White House in the War of 1812. But we would, right, the Brits are our, our strongest ally and best friend. We get over things. Uh, and so the one thing I think the world looks to us, so because sometimes this sort of discussion gets you into, well, right, let, let the Chinese and the Saudis figure it out. And then we become spectators. And, and I would say I think the role the U.S. has been playing is more of a referee. Uh, and, and maybe if we want to stay with nationalist yeah. examples, maybe the Suez crisis, um, where the French and British jumped in, tried to take this, renationalize the Suez Canal, and the U.S. said, no, that's Egyptian. Uh, and, and so the U.S. does get to play this role of referee. And, and I think maybe that's where I think is current policymakers struggle to try to figure out, well, we can't solve that problem, therefore, therefore we should do nothing. No, there's, some, there's, a, there's a role to play. And, and I think, you know, to me, it's more the referee and somewhere that's in between. Yes, yeah, there the gentleman in the back. The if I look at the last two comments, it's <coughs> looking forward, national yeah. interests, cyber threats. Yeah. Whereas when I look at the title, not to go back on the play on the nuance of words, evolution of an incidental superpower, I'd be interested to hear yeah. going forward, is it going to be the evolution from an incidental superpower? Mm. Are you looking at the United States still wanting to be a superpower? Especially with regard to foreign policy and defense strategy. We talked about national interests, cyber securities, Strait of Hormuz. Do we want to be a superpower and how would that relate to our foreign policy and defense strategy? Yeah, that's a great question. And that would be a nice follow up book, wouldn't it? Evolution <laughs> from <laughs> Evolution <laughs> from <laughs> Well, I mean, one of the things, that, the reality that we're facing with is that for the first time since World War II, Ameri uh, most Americans, increasing number of Americans, don't perceive superpower status as benefiting them anymore. In contrast to the 50s or the 60s or the 70s, where people said, America's a superpower and I benefit from that because, you know, whether it's trade or security, people say today superpower status means we get bled, uh, we have to go into all these, everyone always expects us to do the heavy lifting and then someone else gets the reward. I mean this, and what happens I think in Afghanistan may help set that narrative because if the end result of Afghanistan is going to be that China benefits, that we kind of set the table and then China benefits from all the resources and the contracts and kind of the same thing we heard after Iraq. We were promised in 2003 that we would go in, we would liberate Iraq and then there would be all of this economic benefit. We were going to have lower oil prices, we were going to have and then you look at the contracts and other things that didn't quite work out that way. So I think you now have that sense. And that's why I think the question then moving forward is, is that does that sense grow in the American body politic? That is, <coughs> do we need to be a superpower to be secure? Do we need to, to be a superpower to protect our interests? You see that in the, in the uh, Pew polling data increasingly. Americans do too much in the world. We should pull back. Uh, not, you know, not go complete isolationist, not disarm, but, you know, let other people handle it. We see it in the, you know, the reaction, the polling data on the Syria crisis where Americans say, well, that's too bad what's happening, but you know what, I don't want my sons and daughters going there. If the Turks don't want to do it and the Saudis don't want to do it, then, you know, we shouldn't do it. So it, I can't give you a definitive answer yet. I just, that's where, but we're in that point where for the first time since the end of World War II, you have more people beginning to question does this superpower status matter? And then this question of, well, maybe it matters to elites in New York and Washington, but it doesn't matter to Main Street anymore. And you see that rhetoric coming out. Well, you know, New York bankers benefit from this because they're selling deals with the Chinese, but, you know, Main Street is boarded up and shuttered and, and, and the like, and, and so that may be. And then the, the question about the, the de-evolution or the new evolution will have to do a lot with the uh, institutions that we now have. We look at what by all accounts is a very bloated national security apparatus. You know, more than a million people now holding security clearances, how many different duplication of intelligence and security agencies, how many people work at the Pentagon, uh, how sustainable is that, and are people going to say, well, now we have to, we have this sclerotic national security establishment that has evolved and it's now time to really take the meat cleaver and, you know, 
for me, a bellwether will be, does, is AFRICOM still here in 10 years? Hmm. Do people say, well, we don't need AFRICOM anymore. We don't need, maybe we don't need SOUTHCOM. They can just be folded into you, back into UCOM and back into NORTHCOM because we don't need to have that presence and we're going to start cutting back on these things. Uh, we have a point in the book where we think we say, at the end, the real challenge we're facing is, you know, we have a relate, we have a defense or security relationship with some 150 countries right now. And a few years ago, you would ask people in Washington, so which of these matter? And they'd say, well, all 150 matter. No one gives you that answer. What the debates are beginning to emerge is we all agree that it's going to be about 20 to 30, <coughs> but right now the debate is which 20 and 30. And that's where the knives come out of, okay, well, who gets to be the 20 or 30 countries that are the key partners of the U.S.? One reason why we see this uptick in foreign lobbying in Washington, why are so many governments paying hundreds of thousands of dollars now for lobbyists? Because they know that the cuts are coming, and everyone wants to make sure that I'm not going to, my country isn't going to be the one that's cut. And that factors into this, you know, de-evolution, re-evolution uh, of what it means to be a superpower and in terms of what the American commitments are. Uh, and uh, the high point in the mid-2000s where you had a bunch of countries that had these virtual, what they thought were virtual guarantees from the U.S., so countries Georgia. like Georgia, yeah. where the Georgians kind of basically felt that they were basically members of NATO, discovered in August of 2008 that if you haven't signed on the dotted line, and then Ukraine, uh, discovering that, you know, a throwaway memoranda that was kind of propagated in 1994 to kind of keep them off, uh, you know, keep them from asking, you know, well, that's great. You know, the president went to his lawyers and they said it's, you know, it's maybe a moral obligation to help Ukraine, but it's certainly not a legal one. Uh, and so now we're beginning to see that, you know, we're starting to take stock and in inventory of who has a commitment, who doesn't. and. Yeah, I would pose it, so you're right, the rise of China is an important phenomenon, and we'll all live with it for the next 30 years as being an important feature. I would, I always love the contrast between when the Chinese president arrives in Washington state and has dinner with, with Bill Gates and, and every, everyone else from kind of the IT and Boeing sector, and then you contrast that with how the Chinese president is treated in Washington, D.C., and so when we start looking at tensions, for example, either on China or South China Sea, I mean, I would almost go back again to U.S. history to look at, you know, U.S. business and U.S. economic policy used to be the leader in the U.S. government. We're only just really within the last 30 years, we, we tend to look at everything through a military lens that if we're going to be active in the world, it means we must solve X, you know, crises in military means. And so there might be something to be learned along those lines is, you know, how was China dealt with in Washington State versus Washington, D.C.? And will we see that? You know, on, on the IP loss, how does Apple manufacture in China? If it is really so bad, um, how do they, they manufacture it? And I think the short answer is, you know, their, their key to success is they, they're, they, the innovation cycle. Um, they, the, the key to, to American manufacturing, uh, or say American business, is really innovation. So you can copy it and steal it, and that works great for a couple months, uh, and then the next one comes out, and the next one comes out. And, uh, but at some point, maybe the Chinese can absorb this IP and intellectual property more, and we can start seeing some truly Chinese products. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, your question, I like the contrast between Washington State and D.C. To, to think about that. Did you want to keep going, or? You want to go a couple more? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> let, me, let me start here, just because he doesn't just have, have to grade. Then. <laughs> That's yes, right. Can we shift your, uh, your view <clears throat> as far away from the United States' as classical Indian Ocean? Uh, we now are seen as honest broker by, it seems, India and China. But the dominance of oil coming through there is, is India, China, Japan. Diego Garcia is, is the major source of our influence throughout the Indian Ocean. Is this changing both because of our lack of interest and needs and the, and the strengthening of China, not now, but eventually to really control it if they wanted to? What's our future there? The 50-year agreement comes to an end mm. next year. Mm. It's going to be continued. We're pouring billions still into Diego Garcia. Is it going to continue? Yeah, I mean, I think inertia tends to take over you know, in these sort of situations, so I think yes. I mean, the administration's committed, um, certainly the Navy and I think the Air Force, 60% of the forces will be in Asia 
in that theater to include the Indian Ocean. Um, so no, I mean, I think we're, we're Pacific power too. And, and so I think we see that as an important role to play. But I'll also note too, the frustration with the administration, they wanna focus more on Asia, can't get out of the Middle East. And then of course, Russia makes it hard to, to, to rethink, or Russia forces a rethink of US foreign policy in Europe as well. Um, yeah. no, no, I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wait, back here, sir. Yeah. Uh, another specific, the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Treaty, which is now up for ratification. If that's not ratified, whatever one may think about the uh, features yeah. of it, are we in the future likely to uh, deal with a trade environment uh, uh, dictated by the Chinese mm. as opposed to the I, I think the the TPP was one of those ways so part of our, our I think one of our strong threads in the book is showing that the US got to write the rules of the international system mainly and we benefited and I think with TPP that's kind of version two of being able to write these rules so you know that China doesn't does it make any economic sense to include your second largest trading partner uh, from TPP, I'm not an economist. I mean, I tend to think probably not. I know why we're doing that, <coughs> but I, you know, I'm not. At some point, my guess would be China would be incorporated uh, into TPP uh, on some level, because they are the second trading, second largest trading partner for the United States. Um, so you know, most of these agreements, cause the U.S. market is pretty open. Most of these agreements tend to benefit U.S. companies in those other countries. So I, I tend to think we would try to push along those lines. Yeah. I mean, the thing about TPP, the two things that are important. The first is that, as Derek said, it's about <coughs> writing rules and who writes the rules because you can go with us and the TPP or you can go with the Chinese and their free trade agreement for Asia. You can join a U.S. crafted uh, Asia bank or you can now join a China bank. And in some cases, you know, our, our, for the most part, our strategy has been, look, if countries want to do both, more power to you, but you kind of get to see the benefit. You know, it, it allows you to put the two glasses of water and to compare which is a better deal and which has a better, mm -hmm. a better, uh, you know, what you know in terms of the rules and and particularly you know the risk that you run with Chinese institutions as with their currency is uh, capricious shifts. That hey, we've decided that our currency is worth half of what it was yesterday yeah. by fiat. You know that generally investors and, and others don't like that, whereas we are we're more transparent. So that that's a benefit that we have, uh, and so that is part of this. But it is part of this competition of inst who gets to set institutions, who's trusted. I think your point about the U.S. as a referee. You know, do you want the U.S. to be the referee? Do you want Beijing to be the referee? Um, maybe at some point China will be in that role. Maybe it will grow in trust, and and we'll see what it does. But right now they don't they don't enjoy that same level of uh, of trust. For our perspective, what I find fascinating about the TPP and the fact that you know it could fail, I mean it may not be ratified, it may not make through the Congress, is that it does speak to back to the earlier question, the, the point that you know 30 years ago free trade agreements, mo most Americans said alright there might be winners and losers but it benefits the country as a whole. So you would found that there was generally support. Now you see more and more people saying this doesn't benefit us. TPP does not benefit me. Uh, the administration and and uh, the Republicans have not, who support both who support it, have not crafted, I think, the argument in a way that appeals to Main Street. They craft arguments that play well at CFR uh, and in DC think tanks, but that they don't. They're not flying in other parts of the country as to why TPP matters, uh, why Americans benefit from it, and uh, with it, as with other agreements, you have to. There's a domestic political side of there are going to be winners and losers, and you have to have a strategy that will assuage the losers that their interests that they'll be taken care of. And I think some of the opposition to TPP now is uh, segments of America will lose, and you know, well, too bad, you're the losing side, and but that losing side still has considerable political resources, uh, and they're going to be capable of blocking it. And then the risk we run is TPP fails. Uh, and that pretty much uh, is the end of the pivot because that's our really only non-military yeah. part of the pivot to Asia. And then it just becomes, we can put more aircraft carriers, we can have Diego Garcia, and then you're going to have countries in the region saying, why did the Americans solve everything only through hard power? Yeah. So, um, And it'll never be enough. 
and our allies, part of the a key tenet of U.S. foreign policy and defense strategy is promoting our allies. You know, we, we empower our allies through weapon sales and transfers. We enable our allies by doing joint exercises and coalition operations. Um, and all of this benefits the United States because we're supporting the defense industrial base at the same time. And so you can think of a situation for every F-35, for example, you know, we sell to Japan, you get jobs in the United States and you get one more fighter aircraft in theater that you, wouldn't, you, that you don't have to pay for. And there's some real advantages of that. And that's one of the advantages that we really try to draw out in the book.